First thing is I had a slight change in the title of my talk from um, the importance of sunk costs to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, so I'm going to give you a bit of uh, my experience, uh, sort of a love-hate relationship with the idea of exploration renovation. And I have to say, when I was first asked by Ian to come and give a talk, uh, and I asked him what the theme of the conference was, and he said, renovation. I said, what the hell does that mean, renovation? Uh, and then I said, well, boy, exploration renovation. That, that has a real nice ring to it. So I think that's what I'll call this talk. And in the interim, I've sort of figured out what I wanted to say under that uh, umbrella of exploration renovation. And because it used to be called uh, the importance of sunk costs. We'll, we'll call it exploration, renovation, and its uh, incestuous cousin, sunk cost, uh, because that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in terms of how it impacts our industry. And I, and I have to say that my, as I said, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with sunk cost. The first day that I spent in the field doing exploration, after one year of university courses, actually one course in geology, uh, helping out a geo in the summer, we're walking through the bush, and we come upon this big pile of broken core from some previous exploration project. And, and I looked at the geo, Bob, and I said, what's all this stuff? Uh, and he explained that it was core, and he showed me the drill cores. And, and I said, well, why are we out here getting eaten by black flies if someone's already looked at this stuff, they drilled it, they already understand it? And so I got my first taste of exploration renovation in my very first day in the field. The other thing I learned about exploration renovation and questioning the whole sunk cost issue was the geo I was working for immediately put me under a big black blanket with a UV light and made me flash all this core for shielite. So I learned that you don't question exploration, renovation, and sunk costs uh, either, because it's a bit of a sacred cow in terms of how our industry works. So that was sort of my introduction to the bad side of what I call exploration, renovation. Two years later, again, summer job working in Australia for Renison Goldfields mapping uh, an old underground gold mine. We put the first drill hole in um, what would become a multi-million ounce uh, open pit deposit at Pine Creek. I got, two years later, I was exposed to the really good side of exploration renovation, uh, was taking an old site and making it into a fantastic new mine. So as, as I started out my career, I started to have mixed feelings about this whole exploration renovation thing. And when I got into the uh, work world and into doing research, looking at the whole issue of exploration costs and exploration returns, and starting in some ways to question some of the ways that uh, exploration was done and the, the outcomes of exploration, again, starting to get a bit of the, the bad side of uh, the feeling of exploration renovation when it gets out of hand or carried away with, with respect to expenditures. And then in about 1992 or so, uh, I remember publishing some results that showed that we'd been spending way too much money in, in Canada on exploration and not getting very good results. And rather than actually talking about what that meant, uh, as soon as I published that, I had a visit from the then president of, of PDAC, uh, who came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and said, Doggett, stop publishing that stuff. I said, you're, you're ruining the Canadian exploration industry. So again, I, I learned very early on that the exploration expenditures and re-expending and sunk cost is a pretty sacred cow in the business. When the industry started to turn around again, again on that timeline in the early 2000s. Again, I was a big fan of exploration renovation. It was uh, where a lot of the industry started picking up again, going back, looking at some projects that people knew about. It got things moving, and away we went. So again, 
went from the good side to the bad side, back to the good side and the bad side. And I, I sort of have mixed feelings about, uh, about this whole concept of exploration, renovation, and sunk costs. And then in 2007, I moved to Vancouver. And then instead of having just the good side and the bad side, I also got a bit of the, the ugly side of exploration renovation, uh, which is, uh, you know, putting lipstick on a pig and dressing things up and pretending that it's a new project and looking pretty good. Uh, that's the real ugly side of exploration renovation. But once uh, I was asked to give this talk, I thought it would be interesting to, A, explore where we've come in the latest cycle with respect to the amount of money we've spent and what we've got out of that, to just sort of investigate my own feelings on that, but just to see if there's any new lessons or, or new trends that have emerged on that uh, topic over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So I'm going to do that by looking at sunk cost and exploration, renovation, if you will, in the context of uh, both individual projects and in the context of the broader industry. So starting at the project level, part of the reason we have so much reinvestment, re-exploration of projects is the underlying cycles in our industry never allow sufficient time, except for the really exceptional sort of world-class discoveries. Most deposits have to go through at least two cycles before they're able to get through the long process of permitting and delineation and financing and all of those things that usually take longer than a cycle. So in the, in the worst case view of exploration renovation, we waste a lot of money. We go out, we spend money at the top of the cycle, particularly on hopeless projects, that it's just good money after bad. Uh, they're, they're just never going to make it. But in the, the best case view of exploration renovation, we, we're able to actually take advantage of the passage of time in the cycles, and we're able to use new concepts, have new people look at things, apply new technologies, and basically put new money that's chasing the sunk cost, but it actually works in that case, and you end up getting new actual production or new mines. So that's the sort of the, the end members of uh, the worst case and, and the best case of, uh, of putting sunk costs into projects. But what's interesting from a straight, unbiased, sort of step back, objective, uh, economic view is that even in the best case scenarios where we end up with uh, a new mine out of the process, no one ever really looks back to see if the money that comes out of that mine actually would cover all of the upfront costs that were incurred through who knows how many cycles. So we, we tend to talk about sunk costs and call them sunk costs for a reason because they're sunk uh, and they don't come into play in the decisions we're making. So I wanted to, to uh, just give a simple example of the way I think about that. So I chose a, uh, a Chilean case study, which is Cerro Casale. And this is the project history of Cerro Casale. So if you want exploration renovation, here it is in, in one slide. Uh, first drilled in 89, pre-fees in 93, fees in 97, a new feasibility study in 2000, updated in 2004, updated again in 5, updated again in 6, new pre-feasibility study in 09, new feasibility study in 2010, and based on current projections, probably another new feasibility study by about 2020. So, you know, here's a, here's a case uh, where lots of, uh, lots of history in terms of exploration renovation. The other side of exploration renovation is the corporate side. Because of re-looking at projects, going through the cycles, often you don't end up with the same company uh, having the project when it, if and when it uh, is developed into a mine as the company that was uh, uh, responsible for first identifying the project. So in this case, if you look at the corporate history of this example, uh, you know, Anglo-American originally drilled this in, in the late 80s, just for a few holes. Then Bema and Arizona Star took over in 91. Then Placer Dome earned in for 51%. 
Then Barrick bought Placer, and as part of that deal, gave Placer's interest back to Arizona Star. So it was now 49 Bema, 51 Arizona Star. Then Kinross bought Bema, so they owned 50. Barrick owned 50. Uh, then Barrick actually bought back the 51% they gave to Arizona Star as part of the Placer deal and paid them another $770 million for that. So that was 50% Barrick, 50% Kinross. Uh, then Barrick bought 25% of Kinross's interest, so that was now 75% Barrick, 25% Kinross. And then finally, in recent months, Goldcorp has bought Kinross's remaining 25%. They also bought uh, Barrick's 25% and swapped it off for an equal interest in, in Caspici. So now it's a 50% Barrick, 50% uh, Gold Corp uh, case. So it's not just the exploration that gets renovated here, but it's, uh, it's the corporate side of things too in, in terms of the acquisition side. So I did a little crystal ball gazing, looked back at all these various companies to see how much work they did, looked at all these feasibility studies, converted things in an approximate way into dollars of today, 2017 dollars. And I figure, based on all those feasibility studies, all the drill programs, all the work on Cerro, it's probably been about $250 million spent on that deposit to date. If you consider the exploration activity as part of that process, uh, there's probably been about $2.5 billion of money change hands between, among, across different companies uh, over the, the history that I just showed you for the project as well. And then, it sounds a bit like an oxymoron to talk about future sunk costs, but that's how we operate in this business. Then by the time we get to a new feasibility study for this, all of the money that Barrick and Gold Corp will spend in the next five or six years will be then a sunk cost. So they plan to spend probably another 250 million before it gets to that stage. So overall, you can see there's been about $3 billion invested in this project uh, over the past 25 years or so. so Pretty, uh, pretty big sunk cost. But if we go back to a fundamental question in, in the sense is, is a sunk cost exploration renovation world the way, a good way to run a business uh, in, the, in the large sense of, of, of our industry? Well, if you think about the stakeholders in terms of all this sunk cost, from a government perspective, sunk cost is, is money in the bank. You know, you, you, you want to have a, a new mine so you can collect tax royalties, but having continual investment on projects over and over and over is a close second for governments. You're still investing that money. It's still being uh, generating services and jobs in the region where the project is located. Communities, similar thing, that uh, they're able to get a continuous stream of benefits because the money just keeps coming in on, uh, on these types of projects. But if you take the corporate perspective here and you say, okay, who are the winners here on the shareholder front? What's the sunk cost to these shareholders? Well, I think the only clear winner so far has been Arizona Star shareholders that sold out completely uh, to Barrick on this project. Kinross is sort of a net-net. I'm not sure how that plays out based on how much value you give to their beam acquisition. But the jury is definitely still out on Gold Corp and Barrick in terms of whether their shareholders will be net winners or losers uh, in, in this deal. But if we think about sunk costs more on the basis of the actual project, uh, then if, if you do that, then you say, okay, here's the project, how much money's been spent on it, and how much money's going to be uh, produced from it once we actually build this mine and start producing. So will there ever be more money coming out of uh, production of this mine than there was uh, that went into the ground before it went into production? The money that we've considered to be sunk and not relevant to that development decision. From the perspective of the project, if you will, the, the acquisition cost is just companies trading shares and money. It doesn't really matter. So it's, it means there's basically a half there's only $500 million in sunk costs. And, and only is, is uh, uh, in brackets, there are only $500 million in sunk costs. So basically, you'd have to look at what will be generated from this project if and when uh, it, it, it becomes a mine. And I know with the companies involved, it's, it's almost inconceivable that it wouldn't 
generate that much uh, in profit if, uh, if they go ahead and build it. So in that sense, this project ultimately will hopefully, uh, 30 years after the first feasibility study, uh, end up covering most of those sunk costs. Again, whether the shareholders win or lose, that's uh, another story. The other interesting thing about this story, though, is the whole combination now of Cerro Casale with, with Caspici, where, where Gold Corp and Barrick are trying to co-develop these two projects. So we've got a type of interface here between exploration and renovation, and basically exploration or business innovation in the sense of trying to find the economies of scale and working those two deposits together. And don't take this the wrong way, but it, it's, it's only in the mining business where you could call something business innovation when two companies with projects side by side decide it might be a good idea to jointly bid them, build them. In, in our business, we've had so many silos for so long that it, it sounds crazy, but, but business innovation is, is as simple as, well, why don't we do this together? I mean, crazy idea, but kudos to the companies that, that are actually uh, making it happen. Okay, now switching to the industry scale in terms of thinking about uh, exploration, renovation, how does it impact on the broader industry? I wanna look at three quick uh, metrics, just look at the returns to industry, give a bit of the junior perspective because they're a big part of this exploration, renovation, and cycles, and then just give you a picture to talk about some of the long-term impacts of exploration and renovation using the Canadian gold sector as an example. This slide is uh, from Richard Shawty, and thanks to him for uh, allowing me to use it. It's uh, Minex Consulting. He gave a talk at PDAC back in March. Uh, he, he's the guy that uh, does the big broad-scale industry analysis of returns to exploration expenditures. And the thing to notice here is this last column where he's probably the first two rows, which are gold and copper, but the last column where he's divided his anticipated value of the discoveries made in the past decade by the amount of money we spent on exploration in the past decade, and he comes up with a value of 0.4. Any value less than one is bad news if we're spending more money on exploration as an industry than the discoveries we make are worth. So he's painting a pretty uh, negative picture here of what our sector has looked like in terms of the returns to exploration investment. So in his broader study, he shows that discovery costs have gone up dramatically in the last decade, that the quality of discoveries has actually gone down. We're making fewer big and fewer better discoveries, and that the returns from discovery just don't seem to be big enough to actually justify the whole exploration activity of putting money in the ground. Now this is the whole industry, all the failures spread across the few discoveries or the few successes, but still it raises the question again of the bad side of exploration renovation when you, when you look at those sort of numbers. If we look at the junior sector now, this is, um, Oops, I'll just go back to one slide. And so one of, one of the things about looking at uh, the idea of uh, sunk cost model being a bit out of control when you see all of these expenditures not being matched by the, the value of, of the recoveries is that it, it begs the question, you know, what are we doing wrong? And, being based in Vancouver, we asked that question. It's like, well, things got out of hand. We just spent way too much money. That's why the costs are so bad. The cycle was just crazy as usual. And then it comes down to, oh, but, but next time it'll be different. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the mantra. But if you look at the junior sector, and this, this graph is just showing the market capitalization of all the juniors on the TSXV over the last uh, decade or, or two, or yeah, 2003, about 15 years here. You see the big run up, the drop off with the global financial crisis, big peak, then the uh, double black diamond slope coming down here to 2015, where we uh, had uh, the lowest sort of ever uh, market capitalization, lower than when we started the cycle back in the early 2000s. But what's interesting here is what's happened in the last two years. If you're looking for 
uh, some sort of sign of a rebound in the sector. There's a bit of one. Uh, the, this is the end of July numbers that the market cap of the juniors is back up to uh, 20 billion or something like that. Uh, and it's more than doubled since the, the bottom in 2015. Also, the number of deposits on this slide, what's interesting about that is when you look at this huge crash, you know, this is a, a double diamond slope. This is just the bunny hill here in terms of the, the ski slope. The number of companies listed as Canadian juniors on the TSXV is about the same now as it was uh, at the beginning of the cycle, and it's already started to turn back up. This last slide on the juniors, this is just the uh, looking at the uh, equity raised by juniors on the TSXV. Again, you can see, whoops. Again, you can see here that the, the, the peak, val peak year was here in 2011 when the, the juniors on the TSXV raised about $6 billion uh, for exploration. That number plummeted again down to 2015, but look at the trend already since uh, 2015 back to 2016. I've extrapolated half of the year for 2017 back up to here. So if that's right, that's already higher than all but two years in, in the latest cycle. So if, if you're asking the question, will, will next time be different? Did we learn from sort of overspending and what those results show? Well, no. Uh, it won't be different. Uh, it, it already, the, the, same, the same thing's happening, the money's coming back, and, and we're going through the cycle again, uh, it's, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this room. So in, in summary then on the industry scale, we've, we've been spending in some ways like drunken sailors as an industry, we, we've spent a lot more than the returns can show. But you have to remember that there, there's a pipeline of projects here, and from, from the industry perspective, our, our real objective in exploration is not to make discoveries, but it's to make discoveries that become mines and to actually produce stuff. I mean, that, that's, our, that's our objective. We're, we're a business, right? Uh, and we want to find things that are actually going to get, um, get produced. So another way of approaching the sort of exploration renovation issue is to think about the impact on actual reserves rather than on discovery. So unlike Richard's methodology where he was looking at putting all of the exploration against all of the new discoveries, I'm putting all the exploration against all of the new reserves to see what it looks like at the other end of the pipeline. So my methodology for doing that is basically to see how many tons of metal reserves we've added uh, during this last cycle. So over the past 15 years, this is showing, it's what I call the net reserve addition. So it's taking reserves at the end, less reserves at the beginning, plus all of the production during that time frame. And what we see is that in the last 15 years, we've added globally 580 million tons of copper to reserves. You can argue, well, that's partly because prices change, it's partly because different countries report reserves in a different way, but, and these are mainly USGS numbers, but nonetheless, there's been a huge increase in reserve addition in copper. This, this number here, that's the amount of copper that was produced in millions of tons in the last 15 years. So we've added two tons of metal, copper metal in reserves for everyone we've mined in the past 15 years. So if, if you're looking for a metric that says this is a terrible business, we're not doing a very good job, well, at the other end of the pipeline, we're doing a hell of a job. Uh, those, those numbers look, uh, look really good. And the same for gold uh, here. This is just looking at the uh, amount of gold we've added to reserves over that time, which is about 1.5 billion ounces, which is only about 1.2 times what we actually produced during that time frame. But again, it's not exactly uh, uh, dropping off because the gold sector has been growing a lot during that time frame. If we look at one more metric here, which is taking those, expend those uh, additions to reserves and just applying all of the exploration for copper and gold during that time frame. Again, the opposite approach to the way Richard's looking at it by putting them all against the discoveries. Here what you see is if you take all of the exploration for copper during that time frame and you um, 
you divide it by the amount of copper additions through reserves, we added reserves at about 2.6 cents per pound. And in gold, about 40 cents per ounce through reserves. That doesn't sound like it's a big problem to me. That, that sounds pretty good, uh, those sort of numbers in terms of the, the ultimate objective of exploration, which is to add reserves. So we seem to have two conflicting uh, sort of measures or metrics or mes messages here. Uh, one, if we look just at exploration, um, then we seem to be doing a pretty poor job uh, in terms of making discoveries for the money we're spending. But if you consider exploration as, as the ability to add reserves in production, we're, we're really good. Uh, so you've got a bit of a mixed, mixed, mixed message, sorry. So what does that tell us? Well, we haven't been very good at making new discoveries, but we've been really good um, at uh, adding reserves. So maybe the message is that we don't really need to be that good at making new discoveries as long as we keep, grow, keep up with growth trends, we're adding new copper, we're adding new reserves, so growth is going along, and we're still doubling the reserves uh, over the recent cycle. So maybe it doesn't really matter. And that, that's an interesting way to think about it. Uh, and, and it's really how you manage this pipeline because you're looking at the stuff going in one end and, and the stuff going out the other end. Um, and the question is whether or not that is a long-term uh, survival sort of mechanism or is that sustainable that we can just keep doing that over and over and over and over or we're just gonna, the pipeline will just get empty uh, eventually. So, what I want to do is just show you what the Canadian gold sector looks like in terms of production of ounces of gold since Canada was founded in 1867. This is how much gold Canada has produced each year. And you see a very interesting trend. 1930s reaches a little more than 5 million. 19, late 1950s, almost 5 million. 1980s, 5 million. 2016, 5 million. So there seems to be this level that we keep coming back to um, in terms of what is effectively, as I'll show you on this slide, exploration renovation. Because if you look at the output of 5 million ounces in the Canadian gold industry in 2016, in this left-hand slide, you'll see that the, the brown color, the orange color here, that represents uh, the mines that were previous mines that reopened. So more than half of all the gold uh, that's being produced right now in Canada comes from mines that were previous mines that have been reopened at least once uh, during their history. So again, that's the good side of exploration renovation. You keep revisiting these things and you keep, uh, you keep adding uh, ounces. The downside, though, of exploration renovation, going back to the sort of pipeline, is shown here. Whoops, sorry is shown here, where the, this blue color it represents the, the year that the current mines were discovered based on how much uh, production they're putting out. So this is saying that uh, about 60% of all the production in Canada comes from mines discovered before 1970. Another 40% comes from mines discovered between 1970 and 1990. Uh, and only this little gray sliver is gold production from mines that have been discovered since 1990. So you, you, you have to ask the question, it seems like the Canadian gold sector can just keep bouncing back to that five million ounce mark, but the question is, is, is that really sustainable? You know, that was 80 years that's been happening. And on the basis of the same systems and the same mines, basically, at least the same broad deposits. And it's a question of, is that sustainable uh, or, do we have to worry that no one's really found much since, uh, since the 1990s? So it, the, the highlight here is just that the, uh, basically 6% of production is now coming from mines that have been discovered since 1990. And it's not like there hasn't been money spent. A lot of it's been spent on renovation, re-exploring known projects, but there's been a lot of work for new stuff too. So uh, the, if that doesn't change, it's hard to imagine the next 80 years that the same old deposits will keep coming back, even though they're great systems and there's lots of gold in them, uh, that they'll keep coming back to that, uh, that height. So then it's really a question of how, sus ah, sorry, how sustainable that is 
Uh, and again, whether this is any way in the long run to actually try and run a business. So in conclusion, it's been, for me, 37 years since I was rudely introduced to exploration renovation in, in the form of a pile of uh, rotten core boxes and, and broken core and thought to myself, basically, is this, is this any way for a business to work? Uh, but the one thing that I can say for sure about that uh, after all these years and a bit of a love-hate relationship with, with exploration renovation is that the, the good, the bad, and the ugly exploration renovation and, and associated sunk costs, they really are key drivers of our business, and that's not likely to change. I mean, the, the cycles are there, they're gonna be there, we're gonna continue to uh, follow those trends, so exploration renovation is gonna continue to be important. When, when I first started working in this business I, and, and publishing results on uh, exploration findings, I used to get really worried about the fact that it didn't seem to make sense we were spending more money on exploration than, than came out of the ground. After three decades, I find myself a bit resigned to the fact that no one really seems to care about that. It's, it's, uh, um, we're, we're, we're meeting the demand for commodities. Prices stay reasonably low. Uh, for the most part, uh, everyone's happy. And when you look at the results, the recent results of Richard's uh, work, th did that create some sort of panic or crisis saying, oh, no, we're, we're, we're what's the term? We're, uh, uh, we're Instead of creating wealth, we're destroying wealth in this business. No, it didn't create any hue and cry and panic and crisis. In fact, what it created was the opposite. It created a capital crisis that everyone was saying, oh my God, we, there's no more money to be had. There's no one investing in, in junior exploration anymore. So there was a capital crisis that came out of that. Give us more money. And in fact, it seemed like the problem was we, we were spending too much money. So it's very interesting. For me, that, that speaks volumes about uh, the, the good and the bad of uh, of exploration renovation. On the issue of pipelines, uh, with uh, you know, lots coming out the, the end in terms of production, but not going in in terms of new quality grassroots discoveries. Again, I used to worry about that. Not now, not, not so much, really. Uh, uh, because really, if you think about it logically, the last thing you really need to worry about is some type of long-term supply-driven commodity price resurgence, which you hear people talk about. And first, I don't think it's gonna happen, uh, so I don't worry about it. But secondly, even if it did, you know, what, what, what's so bad about high prices? Uh, that, that's not a bad thing if you're a mining company. And it might even, it might even uh, make us consider looking beyond our sunk cost model in considering the next phase of, of all the search space that's out there that we haven't bothered with because we keep revisiting the old stuff and it seems to keep us going. So maybe, you know, maybe that will happen um, if, uh, if we do start really feeling the pinch from, from the lack of good discoveries at, at the front of the pipeline. But until the market actually pushes us to abandon that sunk cost model, I, I think we're just gonna live with the, the good and the bad aspects of exploration renovation. And occasionally, we'll probably even put the lipstick back on the pig and, uh, and, and put our project up there for, for review. But really, what I've learned uh, in all these years in this crazy, fantastic business that, that we all work in is that, you know, lipstick on a pig, sometimes a pig is, is just what you need. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll say thank you, and thanks for your attention.